Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss Varsity Green, a behind the scenes look at culture and corruption in college athletics. Varsity Green distills the myths of the golden era of college sports when gentlemen scholars learn sportsmanship and teamwork. With me to discuss his book is Mark Yost. Mark has worked in business and sports journalism for nearly 20 years. He is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal's leisure and arts pages, writing primarily about the business and economics of sports, and has written for the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the American Spectator. Thanks for joining us, Mark, and I'm Holly Vitsky, Professor of Law at the Massachusetts School of Law. Well, thanks for having me, Holly. Sure thing. Now, most people probably think that college sports started out <laughs> as a, a non-economic endeavor, um, mm -hmm. as a way to enhance the undergraduate experience, yet you reveal otherwise that it was actually commercial in nature right from the get-go. It was. It, it Initially, th there was a brief period of sort of purity, if you want to put it that way, because it was modeled after the English boarding school system where they played cricket and rugby and soccer and that sort of thing. And some of the early universities in the United States, Harvard, Yale, places like that, um, it did start off as, inter as sort of inter collegiate sports within the, the campus but the very first time what's considered the very first NCAA event was this sort of corrupt event that happened on Lake Winnipesaukee it was a rowing contest between Harvard and Yale and um, the reason it didn't happen on the Charles River which mm -hmm. is where a lot of the sculling competitions are today is because it was totally a commercial endeavor it was put together by this guy who ran the Boston Montreal Railroad and the whole idea was to get wealthy alumni to A ride the railroad and B go to Lake Winnipesaukee and spend the weekend he got a cut of everything the players all got gr graft they got they got paid cash they got paid um, uh, little trinkets like uh, silver uh, rowing oars from Tiffany's valued at like five hundred dollars which in you know wow. the 1850s was a lot of money mm -hmm. And um, so it really was corrupt from the very beginning. There was really, as you said, no golden age of college athletics where it was just all about sportsmanship and, and being gentlemen. Hmm. And when did the first known instance of eligibility violation occur? Well, actually, that um, uh, we're filming here outside of Boston, and it happened at Harvard. And mm -hmm. it was in 1855, and the Harvard coxswain was actually a uh, alumni who was a very good athlete who they brought back to beat Yale. Um, so that was one of the first violations and there were all sorts of violations, um, mostly early on involving alumni or professional players that would come back and pose as students and then uh, compete to help them win this competition and then just go away. Is that what happened with college baseball? It, it, it is, there, there, there was um, uh, a lot of uh, professional baseball teams back then. It was, it was before the Major League Baseball was organized. Um, there was a guy named Lee Richmond who played for the Worcester Sentinels not too far from here. He was an alumnus of Harvard. He came back and helped them win a game. Um, there was also a guy, um, uh, Walter Clarkson, who ha came back and played for Yale. Um, and, and there were all sorts of deals that these players got. It, it really was a mix between professional and collegiate athletics at that point. So it started commercial, started commercially right from the beginning. When did the corruption start? Uh, almost immediately. I mean, it, 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 with that, um, as I said, that, that Harvard-Yale uh, rowing match is considered the first intercollegiate match. And that, that was corrupt. And then um, football was very big in the late um, 19th century. That was the collegiate sport, football and baseball. And there were all sorts of examples of professional athletes again coming back to campus after their eligibility had run out of course I, I say <laughs> eligibility but there was there was no NCAA right. at this point but it was understood it was sort of a gentleman's agreement that these were students and that they were playing other students and in reality that wasn't the case and what role did the Ivy Leagues play in this in the early college athletics well, the Ivy Leagues were for the longest time uh, dominant powerhouses right up through through to the 40s pretty much it was after that that they got out of it, but early on, um, Yale football was huge. Um, Yale had a $100,000 um, sort of slush fund that they used to pay players. They, uh, in addition to getting free tuition, they were really paid to play wow. on the football team. There were a lot of sweetheart deals where they would get a cut of 
concession sales, program sales. There are even examples of, of schools like Yale and Harvard, which you would think were had a lot of academic integrity, of arranging jobs for players afterwards. Um, I mean, we see that go on today. But again, it's to, to your point, we sort of a lot of people sort of think there was this golden age of college mm -hmm. athletics when it was all pure and, and about sportsmanship, and, and it really didn't exist. Which football coach has the greatest win-loss record? That is, um, again, we go back to Yale. That's Walter Camp. And um, he, he coached from about 1875 to the early 20th century. And he had a miraculous 280 and 14 record wow. over that time. And um, he's also known for um, creating the down system and the line of scrimmage. Back then, football was really sort of a mix between soccer and rugby. It wasn't the football that we know of today. And, but with camp, it really started with him, and he's the one who sort of laid the foundations for what we know is to be modern American football today. So why, when we think about the great coaches in college football history, we think about Joe Paterno, Lou Holtz, why do we never hear of camp? Well, he's, we hear about him in the history books, and he's certainly in the Football Hall of Fame and mentioned there. But um, quite frankly, a part of it is because the Ivy League um, they don't comp they don't participate in the bowl championship series anymore. They just started allowing their basketball teams to go to the final mm -hmm. the final four, um, but they they pretty much after World War II opted out. They saw the corruption mm -hmm. in the NCAA and and it, you know there's a famous quote um, from Jerry Tarkanian, the old basketball coach for the University of Nevada Las Vegas, and he said. Nine out of ten teams in college basketball are cheating, and the tenth one's in last place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Ivy League saw, was that the, I think after a while, the alumni had influence, and they really did start to become very seriously concerned about their academic integrity. And I think they just saw college athletics as being so corrupt, especially in the early 20th centuries, that they just opted out of it. Now, you mentioned World War II. How did World War II add to the corruption? Well, it added to the corruption because, as you can imagine, a lot of the, the best athletes, a lot of the young guys, 18 to 22, they were drafted or they enlisted in the service. So those players who, for whatever reason, they weren't, you know, they didn't have any physical restrictions, but maybe they had bad hearing, they had flat feet, whatever it was that made them 4F, they were still eligible to play, but they were fewer and far between. So it, it, it actually upped the incentives that teams would pay. It's 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 uh, classic supply and demand. The, the 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 supply dropped and the demand remained the same, so the price went up. So that's that's how World War II impacted college athletics. Now, why did Phil Hughes, who's the associate athletic director at Kansas State University, why does he call athletes the entertainment product? Well, I, I Phil Hughes was an interesting guy that I ran into when I was researching this book, and I started at Kansas State. Um, because I, I, I started talking about Bob Huggins, who was the basketball mm -hmm. coach there for one year. And I went and, and I sort of scratched my head, and it really became for me the focal point of this book, or, or a good, a sort of a good touchstone to really explain to people what this system was all about. And, and why would a school like Kansas State, which does have a very fine academic reputation, why would they hire a guy named Bob Huggins, who was one of the most corrupt college basketball coaches around? Why would they hire a guy like this? And, and that was really the, the impetus for the book. Phil Hughes is, is the uh, Associate Athletic Director for Academics. He's basically in charge of the tutoring center for all the athletes there. And, and all the big schools have them. Um, and they have full-time dedicated 24-hour-a-day tutoring staff for these people. And, and, but Phil Hughes was an interesting guy because he has no pretensions about what this all is all about. He told me that's how he sleeps at night because here he is at a serious academic institution, but his job is to, is to do nothing more than make sure that these kids, many of whom are, would otherwise be academically ineligible to get into these schools, that they maintain their NCAA mandated mm -hmm. C average so that they can continue to participate. Phil Hughes calls them the entertainment product, and, and I was almost shocked at his candor which, I, you know, other people watching this interview might be shocked that this guy would so callously refer to these kids as the entertainment product, but he's just being truthful. He's just being honest, and, and he said to me in the early interview, he said, 
My job is to make sure that the entertainment product gets up in the morning, the entertainment product goes to class, <laughs> the entertainment product goes to uh, study sessions. He says, that's my whole job, and that's how I live with myself. And he was really the most honest guy that I found in this whole, in all of my research, because a lot of people, they dress it up, they say, oh, we're giving these kids opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. We're as committed to academics as we are athletics, and really those are shades of the truth. And Phil Hughes was just an incredibly candid guy and one of the most honest people I found in the research that I did. How does the graduation rate for the athletic departments compare to those of the student body, the rest of the student they're, body? They're pretty abysmal. I mean, the graduation rates, if you take national averages, they're somewhere in the range of 80% for the general student body. And, and that factors in the fact that, you know, people sometimes go to school and it's maybe that school's not a good fit. They transfer, they end up graduating somewhere else or, or whatever. They, they leave college, they decide college is not for them. In reality, the academic rates for, graduation rates for the athletic programs are much lower. I mean, um, you have a few anomalies. Notre Dame is the only program in the country where the athlete, athletes have a higher graduation rate than the general student body, but it's by like a tenth of a point. Depending on the year, it's like 98.2% versus 98.1%. But the majority of, and it's especially big time college programs. And, and you know, we should be clear here early on in the, this interview, I'm primarily talking about men's basketball and men's football because those are the money generating sports. Those mm -hmm. are the sports that pay for everything else. They pay for lacrosse, women's field hockey, golf, all the other sports that really don't generate any positive revenue. Mm -hmm. So to go back to your question, the, the, academic, the graduation rates for a lot of these teams like Kentucky's like 31%. Um, Bob Huggins, who I mentioned, who was the coach at Cincinnati for a long time, went to Kansas State mm -hmm. for a year. Now he's at West Virginia. He got kicked out of Cincinnati, basically, by this woman, Nancy Zimfer, who was the president at the time. The, ac the graduation rate for his basketball team was 0%. Wow. And a lot of times we see these kids coming in, um, they have what they call now the one and done rule. The NBA created this rule that said, okay, we're not going to recruit kids directly out of high school. We want them to go for one year to college. Uh, Bob Knight, who is not the most academically rigorous coach, he's, he's there to win, he's one of these big name coaches that it's win, win, win. He thinks the one and done is the worst thing to ever happen to college basketball because he says, listen, it, it, it really, all it does is make these kids come to college for a year. They don't have any intention of ever graduating. Mm -hmm. If they're just there for a year, they don't have to worry about their NCAA eligibility because they have the whole year to go through. Right. And then when they get to June and they have D's and F's and C's, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because they're going to apply for the NBA draft. And so it's, it's, it's really, um, that's the most recent development that people are really critical of. Now, I also should, also should say in, in reference to the one and done, a lot of people think that the NFL is more altruistic because they have a three-year requirement. Mm -hmm. You have to be out of high school for three years before you can be eligible for the NFL draft. That has nothing to do with altruism or the idea that the NFL thinks everyone should go to college and get a degree. It actually has to do with putting weight on. Most the NFL today, I mean, these linemen are 320, 350 pounds, very fast. The running backs now are 240, 250. This isn't about going to school. It's about putting meat on your bones. The average high school kid, no matter how good he is, a Jimmy Clausen or, or anyone like that, they could not go directly from high school to college or, or to the pros mm -hmm. and compete today. The, the game is much faster. It's a much bigger learning curve from college football to the NFL. And quite frankly, the linemen, even the guys that come out of high school or who are 270, 280, They've got, to go, they've got to go and spend four years in the weight room um, and, and really put a lot of meat and mass on their bones to be able to even survive in the NFL today. So the NFL shouldn't get a pass on right. its, its three-year requirement. And to your point, if I'm correct, the NFL has no college requirement. They just have to be out of high school for three correct, years. Correct. So, so you could go and play in the NFL Europe purposes. or you could right. go play, well, there used to be the Canadian Football League, but um, uh, um, so you could go play there or arena. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't say you have to go to college, it says you right. have to be three years out of high school. But that, let's be honest, 
a lot of these places like Nebraska, Penn State, um, Texas, they're, they're training grounds for the NFL. That's really, that's really all they are. A lot of these kids, you know, they end up, you know, at end of four years with 60 or 70 credits in a bunch of cake courses, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes in departments that are specifically crafted to coddle athletes. And um, they, ha they had no intention of graduating in the first place. They were just there to play football, put weight on, and declare for the draft. So do you agree with Bob Knight on the one and done rule? I do. I think it's I think I, I think it's it's it just exacerbates the problem. I would much rather see the NBA, you know, they did this with LeBron James. He never went to college. Right. He was this phenom that came out of high school and he went right to the NBA. Kobe Bryant. And and, and Kobe <laughs> Bryant. And um, uh, w you know, I would rather see these kids it would be much more honest if they were talented enough to come out of high school and went to the NBA or they went to this NBA Development League, which they're starting, it hasn't really caught on yet. It's it's not as popular as the NBA, um, but I think it's really a step towards honesty. Um, that that uh, it's a place for these kids to go and do nothing but play basketball and not uh, participate in the charade that they're student athletes because they they're nothing of the kind. Right. I want to get back to Bob Huggins in a uh -huh. moment, but first I want to. Um, talk about this Notre Dame phenomenon. Mm -hmm. How is Notre Dame so successful at ensuring good academic progress? Well, How does it do it? it? Well, they're serious about it. I think it's a bit of um, uh, their their Catholic principles. They're, 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 they, they, um, a lot of people think that they're Jesuits. They're not. They're actually brothers of the Holy Cross. And um, I think it has to do with that. And I think it has to do with the fact that they've just decided that, that they're going to hold their athletes feet to the fire that they have to be as academically rigorous as they are athletically and I talk about in the book um, that Notre Dame was actually the first school to develop these student these athlete tutoring programs these uh, student athlete academic centers um, it was an, a guy by the name of Mike DeChico who was a, a, a engineering professor at Notre Dame in like the mid 60s and Father Joyce, the famous president there, called him in and, and said, Mike, we, we, we need you to put together this program for the athletes. There's just a handful of them that probably need some tutoring, need some help. Um, and you know, let's be honest. I mean, I mean, uh, the one thing you can say fairly for the athletes, it is like go, uh, having a second job. I mean, you know, every, every student that goes to college, they, they're focused on their academics, they're studying, they're taking labs, maybe they're doing some work study, that sort of thing. These guys are spending a lot of time focused on athletics, and they should get some credit for that. Notre Dame, by their own commitment and, and this development of this program, has really developed a program that works, and it shows you that you don't have to be, you don't have to take the worst kids, you don't have to take kids that are academically ineligible to be at the school. Um, you know, if everybody hewed to that standard, it, it would still be a level playing field. It would still be academically and athletically gifted kids going to these universities and playing these sports. But Notre Dame is the exception. Um, there are a couple of other schools around um, uh, Cornell, you know, the Ivy League. Mm -hmm. they, they pretty much have um, pretty stringent academic standards. I know uh, Cornell, um, their hockey team and their men's football team, they, they, they have to have serious majors. They have to graduate, um, but but outside of that, they're they're the few exceptions. As I said earlier, most of the schools, their graduation rates for their athletes are at least 30, 40 points below what they are for their general student body. Wow! So it really is um, sort of a, it, you know, and it's odd. Be, it, it's difficult for the college presidents because these programs bring in an incredible amount of money for these schools and they actually as I said earlier men's basketball and men's football support all the other sports and oftentimes the athletic departments run separate and apart from the university the athletic director they sort of answer to the college president but they really don't um, they uh, a lot of college presidents feel in a conundrum they, they they understand the corruption that's going on but they also understand that if they were to take it on it would take up so much of their time it would be a, a years long fight because so many alumni, their giving is tied to the athletic program and athletic success. Um, I mean, we had at Harvard um, in the turn of the 19th century, 
Um, Theodore Roosevelt, Har football was a brutal game at the turn of the 20th century. There were tens, dozens of people killed every year in college football. It was a very violent game. Got to the point where there was a national commission set up to try to, to, try to curtail it. And Teddy Roosevelt even got involved, even when he was president of the United States. And even he could not turn or, or curtail the power of the Harvard alumni who supported the football program. And eventually, um, he just gave up in trying to reform it. And that's what college presidents face today. It's an incredibly powerful fiefdom within the university system that almost no college president wants to take on. Now, you write in your book about Roy Williams mm -hmm. in North Carolina and how he receives a bonus if his graduation rate equals that of the student body. Right. How much is that bonus and why does he receive it? Well, he gets it because I, I think it's, a, I, it's all part of his, his, his salary structure. Roy Williams, it, we should first say that many of these million-dollar coaches, they're not paid by the university. They, uh, Roy Williams makes about a million and a half bucks a year. The university only pays them $260,000. Um, most of these coaches are paid by booster groups. They're paid out of the uh, media revenues from television and radio contracts. Um, they're paid by endorsement deals from Nike and Adidas and Under Armour. Um, only about 10% of a top coach's salary um, comes out of the school's finances. The rest is all paid by these side deals, which are all negotiated by the athletic department. The, the university never sees very much of that money. But again, it all goes to run the entire athletic department. So you could argue that without the big money of men's basketball and men's football, there would be no men's wrestling, there would be no women's lacrosse, um, any of these other non-revenue sports. So, um, and, and part of the reason he gets the bonus is because I think it's a tacit acknowledgement um, that it is a feat to take these kids who are mostly academically ineligible to be at these schools and to get them to meet sort of the general academic standard. Um, uh, but it's a, you know, $1.6 million, $25,000 bonus. It's a drop in the bucket. They get much bigger bonuses for going to the NCAA tournament or the, or the, or the, or the, the bowl games. So is it really an incentive for the coach? Not really, no. It's, 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 it's a rounding error in his, in, his sa in his overall salary. It's a nice thing that they can do it. North Carolina doesn't need it very much. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit of an incentive to try to get him to stay focused academically, but in, in the end it's just a rounding error. Does the school really care? I mean, you just said they're taking academically otherwise ineligible athletes. <clears throat> well, I would go back to my earlier mm -hmm. point. I think there's a lot of college presidents who care, but they just realize that it would take so much time and energy to try to really break down these fiefdoms that mm -hmm. are the athletic departments that are run separate and apart from the university. They, and, and, and this is a good, a good point to make another important point. A lot of these programs make hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Ohio State, Texas, they have a $110 million athletic budget. They don't turn a profit. All the money gets spent as soon as it comes in. It gets spent on facilities, on building these football stadiums. Uh, Ohio State just went through like a $100 million capital campaign to expand the horseshoe, the, the football stadium. They built a new hockey arena. They built a new uh, uh, basketball practice facility. The money, it sounds like a lot of money, and a lot of people are mistaken that they think, oh, the, it's great, the athletic program's bringing all this money in. They're not. They, they're bringing the money in, but they're spending it as, as quickly as, as, they, as, they, as they get it. A good example is Ohio State, as I just said, $110 million athletic budget. Two years ago, they, they had an odd year in which they turned a $1,700 profit. Wow. $1,700 wow. out of a $100 million budget, wow. it's a pittance because, again, they go to support the, the men's golf team, the track team, swimming, these non-revenue sports, and they get spent on these capital campaigns to build these lavish stadiums and practice mm -hmm. facilities. We're going to take a quick break in a, in a minute, but before we do, I just want to return to Bob Huggins. Uh -huh. Here's a guy who himself was convicted of drunk driving. His graduation rate at his previous schools is abysmal, 0% at Cincinnati. Right. So why does Kansas State, an academically oriented institution, hire him? Well, they hire him because Bob Huggins not only revives teams, he revives a school's brand. 
And let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. We, 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 I think we all know this is big business. This is not, has nothing to do with academics, or, uh, but, but these schools also make money off of ticket sales, television revenue, souvenir sales, that sort of thing. Huggins came into Kansas State, which had been, you know, a second or third rate player in the Big 12 um, uh, for the longest time. They hadn't been to an invitation, uh, tur invitation only tournament in 20 years. They hadn't won their, their division in 20 years, their conference. He came in, they had been trying for the past 10 years to get a Nike apparel contract. And what that basically mm -hmm. is, is, is Nike comes in and if you agree that your teams are going to all wear Nike apparel with the logo on it, they'll outfit your entire school, not just the men's basketball and football program, but again, women's lacrosse, soccer, mm -hmm. swimming, all this stuff. Huggins comes in, they've been trying to get this for 10 years. In two weeks, they have a Nike, a $5 million mm -hmm. Nike all school contract. As I said, they hadn't been to an uh, uh, elite um, preseason tournament in 20 years. They immediately get invited to this, this elite tournament in Florida. And, um, they get, and, and that's important for the Big 12 because your revenue sharing is based upon your TV time. Huggins immediately gets them on ESPN national broadcast before they'd been on a regional sports channel. He basically, in one year, pumped about 10 to $15 million into that athletic program. Wow. Out of about a $20 million mm -hmm. athletic budget. So mm -hmm. that's why they hired Bob Huggins. We need to take a break right now. We'll be right back. Because of the highly publicized Karen Quillen case in New Jersey in 1975, the public and lawmakers have paid more attention to whether a person may refuse life-prolonging medical treatment when the person is suffering from a terminal injury or illness without hope of recovery. Lawmakers have responded to public concern by enacting statutes which permit persons to make so-called living wills. A living will is a document by which a person makes known his or her desire and direction that medical professionals do not use measures to prolong his or her life in circumstances where they cannot hope to recover. Federal courts and most state courts have interpreted their constitutions to recognize a constitutional right of privacy to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters affecting a person's fundamental rights. Courts have extended this right of privacy, even in the absence of statute, to allow a competent adult to refuse medical treatment that may prolong his or her life. Specifically, the Florida Supreme Court has ruled, in the absence of any statutory authorization, that the relatives of an incompetent and terminally ill patient could halt extraordinary medical treatment even without first getting court approval. The court gave considerable weight to the patient's, quote, mercy, will, and last testament, unquote, in which he expressed a desire not to be kept alive on a respirator or other life support equipment. The patient had executed this statement almost six years before he entered the hospital, but while he was still competent. The Karen Quinlan case stirred the concerns and imaginations of the public. Quinlan was a 21-year-old woman who had stopped breathing for two 15-minute periods, apparently because of drug and or alcohol abuse. She fell into a deep coma and was attached to a medical apparatus which maintained her bodily functions and kept her alive in a New Jersey hospital. It was clear that although technically alive and not brain dead, the evidence suggested that she was in a persistent vegetative state and would never again function as a thinking human being. It was also clear that if her respirator were removed, she would die soon thereafter. Her father, a devout Catholic, sought guidance from the church. The church advised him that discontinuing the respirator would be a, quote, morally correct decision. He then sought to be appointed guardian of his daughter so he could order the hospital to terminate use of the respirator. Although the state of New Jersey opposed his request and the lower courts had ruled against him, the New Jersey Supreme Court reversed the lower courts and upheld Mr. Quinlan's right to act on behalf of his daughter and remove the life support. The first legislation passed was in California, which enacted the California Natural Death Act in 1976. Since that landmark California law, more than 20 states have passed laws on the subject. Because of the significant variation in these laws, the Natural, National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws has passed a uniform act entitled the, quote, Rights of the Terminally Ill Act, end quote, 
which has been enacted in more than half a dozen states. The act contains a suggested declaration directing a doctor to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining procedures if a person is, quote, in an incurable and irreversible condition that will result in death within a relatively short time, end quote. The act specifically provides that it should not be construed to condone, authorize, or approve mercy killing or euthanasia. This latter provision is designed to counter the objections of many who argue that proponents of living wills advocate mercy killing or euthanasia. So, you need a living will if you want to be the one who controls decisions about ending your life if you are ever unfortunate enough to wind up in a terminally ill state. While your state might have provisions for ending life support even in the absence of a living will, you should strongly consider drafting one or having a lawyer draft one for you to ensure your ability to control these decisions. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. The Massachusetts School of Law in Andover offers an accessible, affordable legal education to both full-time and part-time law students. When making admissions decisions, MS Law looks at all aspects of a candidate's qualifications and does not consider the flawed LSAT. At a tuition of less than half of all the other law schools in New England, it is by far the most affordable. Our teaching and standards are rigorous. Our students learn to think clearly, to write well, and to advocate effectively for others. Decide today to make a difference. Welcome back. Mark, you talked about the coach's salary structure and how they're not really paid by the university itself. How or why, I guess, are these million dollar coaches paid so much as compared to the university presidents and professors? Well, um, as I stated earlier um, in terms of the salary structure, these coaches, in terms of the university's finances, really aren't paid more than the, than the top professors. Um, uh, as I said, like Roy Williams from, from uh, North, North Carolina, his salary is about $1.6 million. Only about 240000 of that is paid out of the school. Mm -hmm. Another good uh, example is uh, Coach K at Duke. Um, he is not the highest paid. He is a faculty member. Um, he's not the highest paid faculty member. They, uh, the dean of their medical school, the guy who runs their investment fund, uh, they're all paid more than mm -hmm. Coach K. But, and, uh, but that's a particularly a function of the way the salary is structured. Uh, a lot of the professors around the country who see this aren't going to like this, but it's a fact. The reason these guys are paid so much is there is a much smaller pool of talented people who can get a team to a bowl game or the Final Four than there are can teach freshman English or engineering. I, I'm sorry to say that, but it's a fact. Um, and it's simple supply and demand. It's that, that again, these guys who are successful who are able to keep this revenue machine going and to keep their teams going to bowl games and, and tournament tournaments year after year, that's very valuable to these universities to continue to run these you know, $100 million athletic budgets. So that's really, it's a matter of supply and demand. There's, there's fewer coaches than there are um, engineering professors. What about coaches of the other non-revenue producing sports? Well, that's, that's, that's where this gets skewed is that we often look at a, you know, a, um, uh, uh, a Mac Brown of Texas or a Joe Paterno of Penn State, they're the anomaly. There's probably only about 100 or 200 coaches in the country who make, you know, these really big dollars. On average, you know, a, a Division II football coach maybe makes 80 or $100,000 a year. Uh, top flight women's volleyball or basketball coach probably makes about $60,000 a year. But when you average it all out, it gets skewed, and of course, it gets skewed by the media because nobody, you know, nobody really talks about the women's volleyball coach at Penn State, but they talk about Joe Paterno. So. And what did Florida football coach Urban Meyer collect in incentives when he won the national championship? He collected about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in incentives because um, he has a whole incentive structure package. A lot of these coaches do. If you win your conference, you get a bonus. If you um, get a bowl bid, even just getting a bid, you, you get a bonus. And then if you win the bowl, you get a bonus on top of that. So a lot of it is performance-based structure, just like CEOs at major corporations. Um, and again, all the major coaches have them, Coach K at Duke and, 
and uh, uh, Paterno and, and, and Tom Izzo at Michigan State, those folks. On the subject of bonuses, you write in your book that Maryland's football coach gets a $50,000 bonus if his players demonstrate good behavior, which means no NCA violations or arrests or right. things that I would expect they, that <laughs> they should do anyway. I mean, why is a coach getting a bonus for things that in his program shouldn't he be expected to do? Well, I, I think it's one of the realities of the culture that we live in. I'll, I'll go back to Bob Huggins for a second. Not only did his players have 0% graduation rates, a lot of these guys had felony records, uh, gun possession charges, domestic battery against their girlfriends. Um, there were instances, um, Bain SUNY Bainhamton just went through a big scandal where some of their players were selling drugs. They were caught using stolen credit cards to buy things. I, I, I think it's unfortunate, but some of these schools recognize that these are not the scholar athletes that we often think mm -hmm. that they are. They're, uh, as I've said several times in this interview, a lot of these kids are quite frankly academically ineligible to be at these schools unless they had some sort of athletic talent. And so, and, and with that becomes some of this behavior. And um, you know, this is also a good time to make a point we tend to look at, think about the stereotype of maybe the inner city kid who plays basketball. It's true for the farm kid from Nebraska who, you know, he's not the greatest student in the world um, and this is his way out of the, fa off the farm. Um, so it's, it cuts across the economic and really the racial spectrum. We're not just talking about black inner city kids here. We're talking about poor white kids from, from Kentucky, Nebraska, places like that. And quite honestly, many of them, as I said, are just not academically eligible to really be at these universities. You touched on alumni contributions. Mm -hmm. What's the correlation between postseason success and the alumni contributions? Well, that's interesting because the Chronicle of Higher Education did a study where you can have a winning football team, but if you don't, or basketball team too, and if you don't go to the postseason, there is not, they haven't typically seen an increase in alumni giving, but if you go to a bowl game or to the Final Four, they've seen a correlation of about eight to ten dollars um, on average from alumni. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you multiply it by a couple of hundred yeah. thousand alumni, it can be, you know, a couple of million bucks that you see go up. Yeah. Um, uh, and there have been, and, and you know, we've seen this phenomenon um, with Boston. We also see it in, in application rates as well. If a team goes to a bowl game or a, or a, or a big basketball tournament, mm -hmm. we saw it here in Boston with Boston College, with Doug Flutie with the Hail Mary mm -hmm. Pass back in the 80s. Boston College saw this huge influx of, of um, applications by students, not athletes, but people who want to go and, and cheer for these teams. I mean, there's kids who go to Duke to be history majors and go to the law school there. But they have no, they're not going to be athletes, but they want to go and be one of the Cameron crazies, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the basketball fans. And is it the deciding factor for these kids? No, but it's a peripheral factor that maybe makes them choose Duke over North Carolina or Duke over Harvard or, or something like that. So these, these bold appearances and tournament appearances can not only affect alumni giving, but also affect the application rates as well. How much do the bowl appearances themselves outside of alumni giving contribute? Oh, well, um, the bowl championship series this year paid $18.5 million to each school. Now, one thing that we need to be clear about, and a lot of people don't think about, as I mentioned earlier, many of these conferences, the Big Ten, the Big 12, um, they have, they share revenue. So every time, you know, uh, uh, Wisconsin goes to a bowl, mm -hmm. Indiana, which doesn't have a very good football program, they share in that money because it's all shared equally among the, uh, uh, and the other revenue structure is the Big 12 which some conferences share money proportionally. What, what I mean by that, it's either determined by TV time or postseason bowl appearance. So for instance, in Nebraska, they might get to keep more of their bowl appearance money um, because they were on TV more or because of the, the postseason appearances. So it's, sometimes it's balanced like that. But, but a lot of that money, that, that's, and, and the other thing is, these schools, they take so many VIPs to these games, a lot of times a school ends up losing money. Hmm. Even if they were to get all of that $18 million, I mean, you think about a place wow. like Texas, they take, you know, um, uh, sponsors, they take uh, prominent alumni that go, past players, and they have to wine and dine them for two or three days in places like Miami and Phoenix. And um, so a lot of times they end up, schools end up losing money on the bowls. Wow. So. 
What role did Congress play in increasing the number of bowl games? They, they didn't really play a role in increasing the number of bowl games, but Congress is starting to get interested in what's going on with the BCS, and, and here's why. Because um, anytime you give money to a university, whether it's the academic side of the house or the athletic side of the house, it's tax deductible. All of this money is, is a write-off. The schools don't pay taxes on it. They don't pay taxes on their, on their stadiums or their facilities. Mm -hmm. And Congress has started taking an interest in this. And quite honestly, it's a bit of jealousy. Some of it's driven by a bit of jealousy. Orrin Hatch got involved in this, a senator from Utah, because Utah went undefeated two or three years ago, and they didn't get a bowl bid because they, they come from a weak conference, and the BCS committee, which, may, which decides who goes to what bowl, they did not give them an invite to the national championship. Orrin Hatch got ticked about this and started investigating it. Bill Thomas from California is another mm -hmm. one. He's more interested in sort of the the IRS implications for this, this idea that um, uh, you, can, you can give mo a, a huge amount of money to a university, an athletic program, and it's tax deductible. The other thing that's interesting is a lot of times when these schools get um, fined for NCAA uh, 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 infractions, the athlete who maybe was implicated in it, he'll pay the fine. Well, what he does is he gives a donation to the school to hmm. cover the fine, and then the athlete that's a write-off on his taxes. Wow. So we had that happen with the University of Am Am Massachusetts Amherst basketball program about 10 years ago. They got into some eligibility problems. Um, the, guy, the player, I forget his name, who, who went on Marcus to... Marcus Canby. Marcus, there you go, mm -hmm. who went on to the NBA and have a successful NBA career. He paid the fine wow. to the school, and then that was all a write-off. Uh -huh. So... <laughs> wow. On the subject of money, let's talk about TV revenues, and mm -hmm. I think that had a lot to do with the recent conference realignment. Can you talk about how that gets distributed? It does. It, um, uh, that's, t TV revenue is really the devil here. It's the boogeyman. It's, it's, the it's, it's the why. It's the why these schools are driven to bend the rules, bring kids who are academically ineligible to come and play sports. Um, and it can be huge numbers. I mean, Auburn, for instance, that when they, their coach Tommy Tuberville, he's since moved on, but, but he had about a $4 million salary package. About $2.5 million was paid by ISP Sports, the media company that had brought, bought their broadcast rights. That's a big chunk of the revenue and the salary structure for these big time coaches. And, and the ISP contract for a school like Auburn, which is, you know, they're a big football school, but they're nowhere near a Michigan State or a Notre Dame, they're, um, they're, they paid $56 million for the television rights, rights. for that. So that, that goes a long way towards, um, it's sort of the incentive for these guys to produce a good team. Does this money ever help fund scholarships? In rare examples, it does. I'll give you two examples. One is Notre Dame. They had the first ever national broadcast contract with NBC. Mm -hmm. um, again, their football team, because of alumni giving and ticket sales and that sort of thing, they're pretty much self-sustaining. The athletic department sustains itself. So when they got the national media contract, they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the money and we're going to use it to, they were building a brand new science, science building. They used it to buy lab equipment. They used it to fund both uh, undergrad and graduate uh, scholarships. Um, the other example is the University of Minnesota. They just built an on-campus stadium. Uh, uh, TCF Bank is the sponsor, or the, the name, bought the naming rights. One of the provisions in the naming rights contract was that they contribute X amount of dollars, I think it's about a million bucks a year, to purely academic scholarships. But as I said earlier, most of this money stays within the athletic department. The athletic department is a separate entity and it's used to fund the other non-revenue sports that don't make any money. So what would happen if there were no TV revenues? Um, the programs would grow a lot smaller. I think that you would probably see some of the, the, the men's programs go away. I mean, one, one of the, the, the sort of, I, I'm gonna use the word victims, but that's not the best word for it. When Title IX came along, which mm -hmm. mandated that you have an equal number of women's sports for men's sports, mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of men's sports that were axed, that were mm -hmm. non-revenue sports. Wrestling was one of the big ones. There were a lot of wrestling programs. Swimming. And swimming mm -hmm. went away as well. And um, I think you would see a, a total shrinkage. I mean, at places like Ohio State and Texas, there's like 22, 24 uh, varsity sports. I think you'd probably see that number go down to maybe 10 or 12. 
Um, and it would all depend upon how much the football program and basketball program could support these other sports. So how much did this TV, how much does this TV revenue play a role in the conference realignment, do you think? Why um, this seismic shift in the I, I think that I think that's what Texas was looking at. I think they were looking at, because again, we'll go back to the Big 12, which mm -hmm. they, they're a member of. They were trying to be wooed by the Pac-10. The Big 12 has a revenue sharing structure that's proportional. It's based upon your TV time, whether the number of times you're on national TV, your bowl appearances, that sort of thing. Texas dominates that conference. Um, uh, so it's, it's really in their interest to stay in a conference where they, where they have the dominant TV time and they get the, the dominant amount of revenues. This whole bowl and conference realignment thing is totally driven by TV money. Why do you call the Big Ten Network <laughs> possibly the single biggest misstep by college sports? Well, because a lot of these television um, contracts are national television contracts. They're contracts with ESPN, NBC, ABC. The Big Ten Network, it was sort of a good idea, but when you think about it, when you run a network, you have to fill 24 hours worth of programming. I mean, this is a lot of the criticism mm -hmm. of news today, that, that, that we're seeing a lot of news that's sort of really not news, but mm -hmm. they have to fill the airspace. You get the same thing with something like the Big Ten Network. They don't get as much money, a much, as much revenue as they did from the national TV contracts. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's 10 football games a year. There's 60 basketball games. What are you going to do the rest? Of, I mean, there's a lot of times when you turn it on the Big Ten Network at 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and it's, you know, women's soccer and swimming, which do not generate any advertising revenue. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bit of a, a, of a cannibalization. Um, and I know you want to get into this. One of the ways that the colleges have retained the power, the, the financial power over the NCAA is through these national broadcast contracts. Notre Dame was autonomous and was, was, was sort of in charge of their destiny in terms of, of television rights and the revenue from that. Whereas um, before, when it was all done by the NCAA, the NCAA determined who got the money, how it was distributed, that sort of thing. So it was really a wedge for the colleges to keep some sort of power in their battle over revenue and rights with the NCAA. And I think that these regional networks, there's a talk of an SEC network um, and the Big 12 and the Pac-10 network, I, I think they whittle away at that and sort of diminish the power, the buying power of some of these institutions. Let's talk about Michigan for a second. Why was the faculty so outraged at the renovation of Michigan Stadium mm -hmm. when it didn't cost the school a single cent, mm -hmm. and more important, it actually generated somewhere, what, ten to $30,000 in academic scholarships? It did, but um, their issue was, and, and you find this on a lot of campuses, especially academically rigorous campuses, um, the faculty are no fans of the athletic department. They know what goes on there. They think it, it degradates the rest of the university and their academic mission. Michigan Stadium is, for lack of a better term, is considered one of the most democratic stadiums in the country. And what I mean by that is it, there were no luxury suites, there was no special treatment for certain alumni. Everybody sat in the same seats. The seats were equally priced. And a lot of people felt that this disrupted that, that this changed the whole character, that it created this us and them versus sort of the little people and the, the wealthy alumni. And they didn't care about the financing of it. They thought that it upset the atmosphere of Michigan Stadium. And that was really the issue. And it was also, again, as I said, um, just another issue for the academic side of the house to complain about the athletic side of the house. Now let's talk about booster clubs. Mm -hmm. What role do they play? They play a number of roles. They provide a lot of money. As I said, um, uh, well, North Carolina State's a good example. When they hired their new basketball coach, they, um, they knew that they would have to pay about $2 million if they wanted to get somebody of the caliber they were looking for. School didn't have that money. The Wolfpack Club, which is one of the most powerful mm -hmm. alumni booster clubs in the country, they stepped up and said, no problem, we have the alumni, they're willing to write checks tomorrow, we'll pay for that coach. And it goes back to this coaching salary structure that we talked about, mm -hmm. that much of the coaching salary structure is paid for by media contracts and booster groups. They also have a negative impact. They often pay players under the table. They get them cushy off-season jobs. Their Arkansas's football program was on probation for a number of years because an alumnus was hiring kids in the summer. They were no-show jobs. 
um, where they were being paid $500 a week for not even showing up to work. Um, that's the negative side of the alumni. But um, for the most part, they are the most avid boosters um, who not mm -hmm. only buy season tickets, they you know build stadiums. T Boone Pickens mm -hmm. gave $165 million to Oklahoma State to build the T Boone Pickens Stadium. Um, Phil Knight, who I know you want to talk mm -hmm. about at Oregon, he's given upwards of four or five hundred million dollars to that program and to Stanford where he went. They are the people who really support these programs. So what's in it for them? Cachet, access. Um, Phil Knight's a good example. He has a suite in Oregon um, where he has a headset where he can actually listen in on the play calling. The coaching staff actually goes to his house every June and outlines their wh what they're doing with recruiting, what their game plan is for the upcoming season. They actually have an a athletic director at Oregon who during the football season, his entire job is to make sure that Phil Knight is happy. Wow. He, picks him, he picks him up at the airport when his private plane flies in. Phil Knight keeps his $300,000 or $1 million dollar motor, ho motor home in the parking lot all season long, goes there, goes up to his suite, and um, it just, it's just, it gives him power, access, makes him feel special. Do they ever, these booster clubs and Phil Knight, do they ever do anything for the academic side of the university? They do. They, um, Phil Knight built the law school and named it after his dad. Um, they also use it, though, to have incredible sway. For instance, um, Phil Knight, the way he got into founding Nike was he was on the track team in Oregon, um, and uh, he was unhappy with what was going on with the track team in Oregon. He had pressured the school to, to fire the coach, to hire somebody else. They sort of pushed him off for a little bit. Then he gave $100 million to the business school at Stanford. And that was seen largely as a shot across the bow of Oregon saying, listen, mm -hmm. my money can go elsewhere. If you don't do what I want, th this is what's going to happen. And within about a month of him giving the $100 million to Stanford, the Oregon track coach was fired, and they hired the guy that he wanted. So. Now, closely tied to boosters are the booster scandals. Yes. And we know of a number of violations at y schools, the most recent being USC. Right. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, why are these penalties given to universities not really a deterrent? Well, th again, because they're a rounding error for many of these budgets. I mean, you, you think about it. I mean, one of the ways they do hurt them is they, they say they can't go to a bowl, which, okay, whether they got there or not, I, as I mentioned, a lot of times they lose money on mm -hmm. the bowls, um, and they restrict some of their scholarships, but usually it's maybe 10 scholarships out of 60 that they're offering. Um, I went through the book and did the math, and um, you know some of the penalties amount to, you know, if it's even if it's a five million dollar penalty overall, what's that to a hundred million dollar athletic budget? It's nothing. It it really doesn't deter them, and they know that um, they're likely not to get caught again, and they're gonna they're gonna keep doing what they're doing because the NCAA uh, enforcement process is so lax. It really is. A lot of people don't understand. The NCAA doesn't have some big policing agency with people who go out and investigate all these things. Most of the violations are reported by the universities themselves. Oftentimes they're discovered by interns. This was the case at Indiana um, where the, 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 coach, the basketball coach, he had been fired from Oklahoma for recruiting violations. Mm -hmm. He was under NCAA sanctions, um, was not allowed to make recruiting phone calls, went to Indiana, continued to make recruiting mm -hmm. phone calls and the only way they found out about it was an intern looking at phone records that noticed a number of three-way calls between another coach and this number that she didn't know about turned out it was the private cell phone number of the coach and this mm -hmm. recruiter this assistant coach was 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 nego was arranging these three-way calls to try to avoid the NCAA sanctions that's how a lot of these things are, are found out or a school finds out that another school in their conference is doing something dishonest mm -hmm. and they turn them in. It's not that the NCAA is this huge policing organization that's on top of everything. The other thing that people would find surprising is that most often when a school is found in violation, they not only are allowed to do their own investigation, they're also allowed to recommend their own penalty. Sure. And oftentimes the NCAA, they say, oh yeah, that's fine, that sounds like a fair penalty to us. And um, it's, it's, 
I honestly don't know how else you would police it, but it, it's a little shady to try to make it sound like the NCAA is this vigilant organization when really they're just relying on the schools to police themselves. Now, I'm glad you raised the Kelvin Sampson incident. Yes. Because this is what I find most appalling about the whole college sports. Mm -hmm. Indiana knew about his violations at Oklahoma, hired him anyway. John Calipari, known for <laughs> skirting the sanctions like a step ahead of it, and right. these schools know that about him too. Why are they hiring these coaches? Because this, it's the same reason that Kansas State hired Bob Huggins. They want to hire a winning coach. They want to hire a coach who's going to sell skyboxes, going to bring in Nike and Adidas, and coaches who are going to bring in alumni contributions, and coaches that are going to take them to postseason play. That's the whole reason they don't care. They, I'm sure there's some discussions about this, about you know, try to keep your nose clean. But again, a lot of these college presidents, the, the, academic, the athletic departments operate outside of their purview. They, 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 and it's really a, a deal between the athletic director and the coach. And they do it because these coaches bring in a lot of money. That's the simple answer. And um, uh, even when they have criminal records, it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter to them. Wow. So when these violations occur, the players are getting penalized by not being able to go to a postseason, whether it's the Final Four or bowl games. Right. The departments are getting penalized with the lack of scholarships and ability to bring in new players. Why is it that the coaches who are often lockstep in with the violations getting off scot-free? Well, because, again, the schools, um, the, the schools know that the coach is going to continue to coach, continue to bring in the big money. and But you make an interesting point that, that the kids are the ones that are hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because that's the big critique of this system. That's the consistent critique of this system is that everyone is making money except these kids. These kids are, uh, granted they're being given, you know, a scholarship for four years if they remain healthy to go and take advantage of whatever academic opportunities are offered to them. But it's really a system that some people have compared to slavery, that have said that uses, uses slave labor. These kids are expected to go into this multi-billion dollar business, not take a dollar from boosters, not um, have an agent, not have anyone representing them, just play for sort of the glory of the university while the university racks in mm -hmm. all this money on top of this free labor. And then um, the, other, the other critique of it is that, that these kids really aren't getting an education they're going, they're going into these cake courses and departments that are they're sympathetic to the athletic mission and that they end up at the end of four years with 60 or 70 credits, no opportunity and no prospects for a pro career. And they end up going back to wherever they came from, whatever farm, whatever inner city neighborhood they came from. And it's overnight, it's all gone. No more tutoring, no more training table, no more uh, uh, you know, being the big man on campus. And that's the real tragedy of this system. I, you know, there's one statistic that keeps popping up throughout the book over and over. This idea that, it, and it's 2%, and, and what I mean by that is about 2% of the kids who play high school basketball get NCAA scholarships to play basketball. Less than 1% of those kids have any meaningful NBA career. They may pay for a couple of years or go play in the World League or something. So it's really a lie that's being told to these kids, this idea that, okay, you play hard, you study hard, and this will lead, this will lead to a pro career. And in reality, it's not true. And the media compounds it by focusing on the 2% of kids who make it and completely mm -hmm. ignoring the 98% of kids who, again, end up back home, 60 credit hours, no degree, no future. It really is tragic the way we treat some of these kids. It's a system that uses these kids and then just throws them away when they're done with them. Mm. Unfortunately, Mark, I could talk about this with you all day, <laughs> but we're out of time. So I want to thank you for being on today's show. And if you want to read more about his book and how this affects youth sports and the shoe contracts, get a copy of Varsity Green. Thank you for joining us. I'm Holly Beatsky. Mm -hmm.